right side, so QNEX. We decided to learn from, from the past history of people trying to solve scheduler problems. We came to a number of conclusions. One of the conclusions we came to is numerical priorities are chosen by individual designers, often without communicating with each other. But scheduling, the term of the behavior in the entire system, has to be turned globally. As it turns out in practice, it's very difficult to take an organization with several hundred designers and have them individually pick priorities without communicating. Typically what you find is that system integration time, somebody somewhere has chosen the wrong priority number, and you find you have to start shifting many priorities around integration time. No problem. Degradation and overload. The story, the stories of telephony explain that what we're trying, really trying to do with priority is to attribute a level of importance to a piece of software. And unfortunately, that importance isn't constant. It varies with the circumstances. Telephony guys distinguish between normal operation, restart, emergency recovery, and maintenance modes. So you cannot, in general, choose a fixed priority, which is going to be good for all time. Next observation is the scheduling strategy needs to be used on, on what work you're actually doing. Um, but all we have is individual threads. Picking individual thread priorities doesn't necessarily give you control over a target of work. Another observation from the router example <coughs> was that some customers really do sell their CPU throughput, so they want fine control and fine measurements so they can bill accurately. And we decided that there could be a lot of confusion when the software designers <coughs> talk to marketing people and salespeople and try to explain how do you actually configure some complex scheduler and get a desired system behavior? We decided the one number that the customers and the marketing guys and the software engineers would agree upon was a percentage of CPU because it was simple to understand. So we decided that's the primary number that a scheduling API should use as the primary control. And the last bullet is the most important one. We need to find a way of throttling 3D CPU usage without losing real-time latencies. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be writing a batch scheduler and can access a real-time operating system. All right, now I can answer the question, what is partitioning? So the general answer on the left is, in general, partitioning is a separation of work for the purposes of isolation. What we want to do in partitioning typically is isolate CPU usage, memory usage, system resource usage, and failures. Why? It's because of the failures. We want to make sure that when one unit of work uses up too, too much CPU time, it exhausts all the memory, takes up all the resources, or just starts writing to random memory locations. It doesn't affect some other unit of work. Separation of failure is really the primary motivation for partitioning. <clears throat> now, in the past, people have attempted to solve this problem of how do you get separation by producing either high hard wall partition schedulers, or in the extreme case, virtualizations where they simulate individual uh, CPU boxes uh, on uh, one CPU where you might have four or five or a dozen software simulations of an entire computer. That's fine, except it tends to produce inflexible and <clears throat> inefficient division of resources where you cannot reassign idle time and you can't change the, the configuration dynamically. We came to the conclusion looking at all the solutions is, you know, there's really no reason to have a system, uh, a partitioning system, which cannot be configured dynamically. And there's also, we concluded, no reason to force the CPU usage and memory usage boundaries to line up. We can make them line up if we want to, but we decide this no way for your reason. So QNIX's answer to this is, we're not going to give you one tool, we're going to give you a bunch of tools. We decided, that first, we're going to give you a POSIX compatible design, which can be applied to existing systems. So unlike ARIC 653, you don't have to rewrite your messaging. In fact, you don't have to rewrite any code at all. You can just prop the system onto your existing code, and you get partitioning. We're going to give people a global, hard, real-time scanner with overload and protection and CPU guarantees. Plus, we're going to come up with some clever way of deciding what working for common purposes so you don't have to create enormous lists of thread IDs to specify what partition a particular thread is in. We're also going to give you runtime memory and kernel object guarantees and limits. We're going to give you a persistent file storage system with guaranteed limits. And, oh, wait a minute, we've already done this one. Process model for fault isolation. That comes for free with QNX. And we're going to make all this dynamically. Now, there's a lot here. For the purposes of the rest of this video, and any sequels if the producers permitted, I'm just going to be talking about the global hard real-time scheduler guarantees, which we decided to call adaptive partition scheduling. Okay, now I can talk about the requirements for adaptive partition scheduling. 
I'd rather talk about requirements because the process guys seem to get on my back that every requirement has have, have to have a test case. I'm going to call it principal because you can't write a test case for principal. I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, the history of uh, Sprack scheduling has told us that it's very difficult to use in practice for more than an occupation. In fact, only one of our customers has effectively used Sprack scheduling, and even they only use it for a single thread in their system. So we decided, hmm, if we're going to write a new scheduler with this extra complex behavior, it's going to have to be engineerable. We also decided that any scheduler has to mesh with the current KNX architecture, which means it still has to have some basis or some behavior that is priority granted. And it has to be consistent with the large volume of message passing that we encourage in the KNX program model. Fundamentally, it must be a fair share scheduler, because that is, of course, the whole point. We want some way of firewalling and protecting the CPU resources for a particular application without affecting someone else. At the same time, it's got to be a real-time scheduling system, at least under underload when there's enough CPU time to go around. That's okay. But wait, we want it to be real-time even during overload. Ooh, that seems difficult. Choose. Is it going to be uh, some kind of scheduler that limits what you can do? Is there going to be some kind of scheduler that lets you run anytime you feel like doing? <clears throat> and the first bullet is perhaps the trickiest one to understand. The scheduler must not trigger an overload. This is a statement like a doctor agreeing to cause no harm. It comes from a story of telephony again, what the telephone system guys discovered two decades ago. When they created one of these large telephone transaction processing systems, as they increased the number of incoming telephone call requests to the control processor, the number of completed calls would increase one for one, until they got to some critical maximum when all of a sudden the call completion rate fell to zero. Ooh. And then when they backed off the load, it didn't recover. It stayed at zero. It took them a while to figure this out. What was happening finally it came down to it's Mother's Day. The system's very busy. Somebody in Saskatchewan picks up their phone and gets an old alto. So they reach over the switch up and go whack whack whack. What happened to the terminal the system is picking up the receiver sent a message to the control processor saying, hey, somebody's picked up the receiver. You might want to consider giving this guy delta. But that message was not processed in time. The user timed out and went whack, 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 which sent another seven messages, which also queued up. What was happening is because there wasn't enough CPU time to process the first message or the first unit of work, all of a sudden there was more work to do. The, more, the slower the CPU got at completing work, the more work it had to do. It caused a cascade failure or an avalanche, which caused the call completion rate to go to zero because Basically, all it was ever doing was receiving new messages that it could not process. Lots of investigation later, they came to the conclusion that the fundamental cause of this problem is that the overheads in certain key places of the system, like the scheduler, for example, had to be designed very carefully so it did not increase with the number of threads that were ready to run. And we took out that little lesson in that, the, that disaster and put it into the principles here. And we decided that if we're going to write a new scheduler, we're going to be very careful and make sure that our overhead does not increase the number of ready threads so that we can never trigger an overload uh, cascade. Okay, now you might consider that these are great principles, but we've totally overconstrained the problem. There's no way you can possibly make a real-time scheduler that's also fair share because after all, fair share schedule is fundamentally a batch scheduler. How can you control the latencies? And you know, this overload stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Well, sorry guys, we actually wrote it. We wrote it in QNX 6.3.2. You can actually use it right now, and it works. Now, to see how it works, you'll have to come back for the scheduler. Part 2 talk, which describes the internals.